Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have all of you here as we gather in our Lord's house again to offer worship and praise for all that he continually does for us each and every day. Thank you for all your prayers and care and support um, during um, my getting over COVID. I think I'm over the majority of everything now, although I did get that fun secondary infection of bronchitis that they had to treat after the fact, but they say that's typical. So over COVID, glad to be done with it, feel a lot better than I had prior to that. And so hopefully none of you get it in. If you've had it, you know what I'm talking about. So, but it's good to be back with you. Um, communion, we'll go back to our um, way of doing it before and we'll al- alternate the sides coming up to the sides to do communion at the rail. So with that, we follow our order of divine service. It's printed out for us. And we begin with our opening hymn, number 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in singing our Kyrie and Gloria. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his faith, face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? 
I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing, sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand and speak our Alleluia and verse together. Alleluia, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We join in singing our creedal hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our meditation today comes from our gospel lesson of Luke 5, was read a few moments ago from the lectern. Dear friends in Christ, as we come now to this, the fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany, it might be good for us to recall a little bit what this season is all about. The season of Epiphany is all about the revealing of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, who is true God, true man for all people. We saw that took place as we just got done with Christmas. The incarnation becomes, um, the, the shepherds come and Jesus is revealed to them in the manger. And then we have Epiphany itself, where Jesus is revealed to the wise men, the Gentiles. And we know that from our study of scriptures, he's been revealed to all people for all time. So we're moving quite quickly through Epiphany here, and it's good to always remember about the Epiphany of the revelation of Jesus Christ for all people. In our sermon text for today, we're going to go back and look at an example of how our love for Jesus and how our trust for Jesus, our Savior, gives us the ability then to listen to our Lord and to humbly say this, because you say so, Lord. There are two applications we want to make today with that in mind. First, let's see how our love for Jesus and our trust in Jesus listens, um, leads us to listen then to our Lord and Savior and humbly say, because you say so, Jesus, I will take time to nourish my soul. And then, let's see, secondly, how our love for Jesus and our trust for Jesus, our Savior, leads us to listen to our Lord and humbly say, because you say so, Lord, I will follow you. Our gospel lesson today opens up on the beach of the Sea of Gennesareth, or the more commonly known, what we know as, as the Sea of Galilee. Luke writes this in our text, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good picture of what the church should look like, if you ask me. A pretty good picture of what church should be. A packed church where everyone wants to sit in the front pews and they want to be as close as possible to the preacher and hear the word of God being preached to them. Jesus, he, he's there, the crowd's pressing in on him, and he goes over to one of the boats, which just happened to be Peter's. He gets in that boat and he says something to the effect of this to Peter. I'd like to use your boat as my pulpit this morning. How about pushing off from shore just a little bit? And he sat down and taught the people from the boat, our text tells us. Now, try to picture this situation described for us here in our text here. Peter and the other guys out there, they had just spent all night fishing. And in the morning after a very long, hard, and fruitless night, they hadn't caught anything, Peter wasn't done with his work yet. He still had a bunch of work to do. Those nets that were so vital to his livelihood and to his fellow fishermen out there, they needed to be washed. They needed to be taken care of, mended if tore. They needed to be folded back up so that they could go out again. So there's Peter. He's diligently cleaning and working on his nets. And Jesus steps into his boat and he tells him, put out a little bit for me here. Come on, push out on the boat. Jesus wanted to use Peter's boat as a pulpit as he taught the people the word of God. Could Peter afford to put his work aside? Well, no, he actually couldn't. This was an important part of his livelihood, of his vocation and his job. But instead of complaining, instead of questioning or suggesting that perhaps Jesus could use someone else's boat, Peter's love for Jesus and Peter's trust in Jesus led him to listen to his Lord and humbly say, because you say so, Jesus, I will take the time. You know, for me, it, it, with all of our supposed time-saving technology out there, it seems to me like we're so much busier than we've ever been before. This requires each and every one of us then each and every day to prioritize our lives so that we can make sure and get the things accomplished and achieve those things which are the most important for us to do. With that in mind, let me ask you this, my friends. Where does the nourishment for your soul come on a personal priority of your list? Where is that priority at on your list? The nourishment of your soul. 
by God's grace, each and every one of us then have been brought to faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin. And by God's grace then, we know that the only reason we are assured of eternal life and a glorious eternal life in heaven is because of what Jesus did for us on that cross on Calvary. What do we do when Jesus comes to us and he says, I want you to take some time to gather around my word and sacraments so that your faith may be strengthened and your soul nourished on a regular basis. Do we sometimes balk and say, I really don't have the time, Lord? Do we hesitate and say, I'd love to, Lord, but with so many th other things going on right now in my life, maybe later, may maybe I'll get to come back to you know, church another time. And and sometimes it's even come down to it as we're sitting here in our little padded boats, our padded pews. We sit here in our church pews and think, as we're sitting here listening, I've got so much that I've got to do today. I wish I just didn't have to be here. The only way to overcome the rebelliousness of our own sinful nature is to contemplate that cross on the hill of Calvary. When we stay focused on the love of the cross of Jesus Christ and what it proclaims to us, when we stay focused on what God was willing to take the time to do so that we could all be saved for all eternity, then when Jesus comes to us and says, as he did in Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, or in Luke 10, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed, or in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well, then our love for Jesus and our trust in Jesus will lead us to listen to our Lord and humbly say, because you say so, Lord, I will take the time to nourish my soul. Once Jesus had finished teaching the people the word of God, he turns to Peter as he sits in that boat, and he told Peter to do something that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Luke tells us in our text, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. It always amazes me when I see how quickly our Lord moves from calling us to, to sit still, to take time and sit still and listen, to his learn and, or listen to his word and learn from his word as he teaches us spiritual things than to call us to get up and to go to work. It's a very quick process. We're not to come and hear the word of God which says, tells us that we are saved by grace alone and through faith alone in Christ for Christ's sake alone and not by your works and then leave church saying, no, I don't have to do anything. In fact, God doesn't want me to do any work at all because I'm saved. We go from hearing the word of God, which is since we have been justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and have peace with God, we go at, to work at whatever our present calling and our present vocation is in this life and what it might be as a children of God. This is very practical stuff. God wants us to be nourished and fed, and then when that's done, he wants us to get up and go back to life and the places we've been called to be in and our vocations and our livelihoods and to work for him. As we look at this text, we have to remember, Peter and those other fishermen out there, they are professional fishermen. Peter had been fishing the waters of the Sea of Galilee most all of his life. Peter knew, as well as the other ones out there, that the best time to fish was during the night, not during the day. And Peter knew that if you wanted to catch fish and let down your nets, then in the shallow waters, not in the deep water. And yet, even though Peter warned Jesus that this just didn't make a whole lot of sense to do, Peter's love for Jesus, Peter's trust in Jesus, led him to listen to his Lord and humbly say, Master, we have toiled all night, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Generally speaking for us, when God's word contradicts human reason out there within the world, we want to side with human reason and reject God's word. 
Because if it doesn't make sense to us, we want to follow our own reason and our own mentalities. We all think we know better than God. But Peter actually shows us what it means to live by faith. Just think of what this world would be like if everybody responded to God's word like this. How differently would our families look? How differently would our relationships be? How different might the economy be? How different would politics be if we were to say, I know it sounds foolish and even dangerous to go against all of my own human reason and experience and what seems to me like common sense, but I'm going to leave all of that stuff behind and listen to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and stick to his word as the only source and norm for all of our human lives. Our text tells us then, when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Here's the really neat thing about this text. The word of God was in that small boat with three fishermen and his word went out and his Their nets were filled to the point of breaking and their boats were filled to the point of sinking. But Peter's response, as we hear in our text, is is very strange. Instead of overwhelming joy of what has taken place here, Peter experiences overwhelming fear. There's a crisis at sea that has nothing to do with the fact that the boats were sinking. The crisis is... The fishing is just way too good. This is way too generous. Way too much has gotten into their net. And this is Peter's epiphany. He now realizes who is in the boat with him. He knows who's sitting there with him in that boat. And, and he knows what, it, what is in that deep dark of the sea and, and who is able to call it to the surface and, and, and that which is now able to call the same in the deep dark sea of Peter's heart up to the surface. God calls those fish from the deep dark of the sea up so that they can catch, but it also now has called up Peter's sin from within the darkness of his heart to the surface. And Peter knows that he too has now been caught in the net. And now, not only this boat, but the whole world seems way too small for Peter. This is nowhere for Peter to be at. And actually at this point in time, Peter has absolutely nowhere to hide. And so he speaks those words that causes even the angels in heaven to gasp and turn their head in horror when he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then Jesus says to Simon, Do not be afraid. In other words, don't look at your sins, Peter. Look at me. For I am gracious and a merciful and abounding in steadfast love. I've come to take away your sins, Peter, and cast them into the depths of the sea. So simply trust me. Don't worry about whether you're a sinner or holy, but simply and without fear put your complete trust in me and my word of forgiveness. When it comes to the way for you and I, that we are to carry out our daily work and our vocations in life, Peter's just a great example for all of us to follow. And he says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. By virtue of the saving faith, which God himself has created in your hearts, you have been called by the God of heaven himself. And whenever, whatever you might do, to earn that living, to have a job, whatever you might do to have to feed your family, pay your bills, over and above absolutely everything else, you have been called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ. You are his children. Does your life faithfully faithfully reflect this reality? When you have the opportunity to use the gift of God, gifts of God that he's given to each and every one of you to serve him by serving his kingdom here on this earth, does your love for Jesus and your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior lead you then to listen to Jesus and to humbly say, because you say so, Lord, I will follow you. 
When the Lord tells you that one way to openly express your thankfulness to him and for all that he's done for you uh, here on this earth is for you to cheerfully bring your first fruits offering to his altar, does your love for Jesus, does your trust in Jesus lead you to listen and say to your Lord humbly, because you say so, Lord, I will follow you. When the Lord reminds you that one of the most powerful ways that you can be his witness to your family and your relatives and your acquaintances and neighbors is simply by the way you live your life, does your love for Jesus, does your trust in Jesus lead you to listen to your Lord then and humbly say, because you say so, Lord, I will follow. Because I say so, it's not always the answer that we like to hear, is it? May God grant that in the light of the cross of Calvary, that no matter what Jesus tells us he wants us to do, and no matter what Jesus tells us he does not want us to do, may our love for Jesus and our trust in Jesus lead us to listen to our Lord and bow humbly before him and say, because you say so, Lord, amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We stand for prayers. Holy Lord, open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to the sound of your voice, that your word may dwell within us, transform us by your grace into your holy children, and equip us for your service. Lord, and your mercy. Holy Lord, place your blessings upon your church and those who serve her, especially our synodical president, our district president, our pastors, all missionaries, and all church workers. We pray for those now preparing for full-time service in your church. Grant them gifts sufficient for the task, prosper the work they do in your name, and make them bold in the proclamation of your gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, Give wisdom to those who lead us in this land and to all the leaders of the nation. Guide them in the path of peace, encourage them to act with justice, and lead them to protect the weakest and most vulnerable among their citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, grant us your Holy Spirit to overcome the fears of our heart so that we may, with unhindered voice, proclaim Jesus Christ to all people. Bless all the newly planted congregations of our Synod and the work of outreach here and everywhere across the world. Lord, and your mercy. Holy Lord, give your light to those whose minds and hearts are clouded with darkness and fear. Give your healing to the sick, the hospitalized, those preparing for surgery, and those recovering, and especially remember Becky Johnson, who continues with health issues. Surround them with your presence and your peace in their day of trouble, according to your good and gracious will. Lord, and your mercy. Holy Lord, be with those families who mourn, especially remember today the family of Del Utec who died yesterday, and be with those near death, and grant all of these your servants the comfort and hope of the resurrection from the dead and the gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Lord, and your mercy. Holy Lord, you grant us many and rich gifts from our talents and abilities to our time and material goods. Inspire us by your giving love to be generous with the poor, to be faithful in the tithes and offerings that support your work of your kingdom, and to be grateful to you at all times and in all places. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, we come to your table bidden by your promise. Grant us true faith to acknowledge the presence of your body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine in your holy supper. And equip us with your spirit so that we may be ready to receive all the gifts that come through this communion. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, you know better than we the needs of your people and the desires of our hearts. Grant all things beneficial to us and to our salvation. And keep from us all things harmful 
For into your hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I exhort you in Christ that you give attention to the testament of Christ and true faith. And above all, take to heart the words with which Christ presents his body and blood to us for forgiveness, that you take note of and give thanks for the boundless love that he showed us when he saved us from the wrath of God, sin, death, and hell by his blood, and that you then externally receive the bread and wine, that is, his body and blood, as a guarantee and pledge. Let us then in his name according to his command in his own words, administer and receive the testament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We join in singing the Sanctus. The peace of the Lord be with you all. We sing the Agnes Day.
we stand for our post-communion prayer. O God of love, in this meal you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come, when all the hungry will be fed with good things. Send us into the world to tell everyone what you have done and to proclaim the greatness of your name. We pray in the name of the one who is coming again and whose day draws near, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We remain standing as we sing our closing hymn. Please be seated. Again, good morning to all of you. It's great to have you here as we are getting closer to the end of our Epiphany season. A couple more Sundays in Epiphany and then Transfiguration. And that first week in March, we'll be getting our Lenten season with Ash Wednesday and go to our midweek Lenten services as well as our Sundays in Lent as we move forward in our church here. As you go about your walk with the Lord this week, the Lord asks you to, because he says so, to take time and nourish your soul, and because he says so, to get up then and um, live your lives as his child, um, telling others about Jesus within your life and your vocation and all that entails. Have a great rest of the week with the Lord. I'll see you in the back.